Welcome to The Advocate, a platform for conversations with those advocating for business in the Charlotte region right now. Hi, my name is Kelly O'Brien, and I serve as the Chief Advocacy and Strategy Officer at the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance and the president of our foundation. And today I'm here with Kristen Morris, a member of our advocacy committee. And I'm so excited to speak to you, Kristen. I know that you have a great title at Atrium Health, Enterprise Senior Vice President and Chief Government Relations Officer. So welcome, Kristen. Thank you very much. It's really great to see you. How long have you been in this role? Two years, a little bit over two years, actually, but I just moved to Charlotte a year ago. So I worked remotely for the first year due to the pandemic. And uh, so I'm still getting my sea legs a little bit, but you can't really stay that much longer after you've been around for two years, right? <laughs> Fair. And I think you and I have, you know, very similar timing in terms mm -hmm. of being able to call Charlotte home starting last year. And I think I know from our conversations, you know, how much we love being here. It's such a great city. It really now, is. It, and I know that prior to joining Atrium, you were also in a role in that life science health space. Is that right? Yes. So I came from Cleveland, Ohio, where I was essentially external affairs, but I was the chief government relations and community relations officer. So it really tied together. How do we walk the walk and then advocate for it um, in a really nice way? So how did you find yourself kind of specializing in this space? Well, um, started off not in doing anything in government relations, but I did have my first job out of college was on Capitol Hill, and I worked there for about five years before I um, moved into trade associations. And so I um, really grew my affinity for provider care, um, working for the American Medical Association. I ran the lobby shop for the American Hospital Association for about eight years. And then, um, and I stayed in life sciences through pharma. I went, I worked for two pharmaceutical companies and ran their Washington offices before I moved to um, back to the hospital land. But, you know, great experience in being in pharma and for-profit medicine, but um, in terms of learning to manage and the understanding of the whole, you know, supply chain, et cetera. But my heart is with providers. And so I just love working with hospitals and I'm so grateful to have like be on the ground for such leadership organizations like these. Well, and you know, it's ATRAM is in the news all the time doing such amazing work. And for our listeners, I wonder if you could help us understand a little bit about this Advocate Aurora and this merger and what this means for ATRAM and what it means for our region here in Charlotte. Health systems are essential to navigating like the pressures that we're all experiencing regulatorily, financially, um, best practices, et cetera. So I'm a you just got to know going in, like I am a firm believer of health systems in, in terms of how we have to actually manage medicine for the future. They're the hubs. I mean, it's, it, there's, I could go on and on and on about it, but just give me that for now. Um, mm -hmm. What's really remarkable about the Advocate Aurora combination, uh, first of all, it's pending. So there's not a lot that I can say because we haven't been able to really work together and iron out a lot of details, but those systems that truly are acting like a system versus a holding company are ones that share that mission and that vision for what they're obligated to do for their communities and for their patients. And their history and culture is just spot on with the way that um, Atrium Health thinks and you know looks at its for all mission. Um, and so I, I just feel like the, the, the success of this is gonna be always dependent upon the culture and we've got that down. Um, and you know, I'm, Ironically, and in a personal, like, you know, fun fact, um, I was born at Lutheran General, which is an uh, advocate hospital. So it's like oh. kind of like it should always be about me, right? Yeah, so, <laughs> it's kind of full circle, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, that's great. But it's, you know, every every system, like I said, is a little bit different. Like bringing Wake Forest into this family was, you know, tectonic. I mean, it's been great for the community, great for Charlotte. And this is going to be great in different and complementary ways. Well, and of course, you just mentioned Wake Forest, and there's a medical school that is underway. Can you help us understand what the timeline is for that? And again, how, how great that Charlotte is going to have a medical school. So you're going to start seeing um, the, they call it this, I think it's called a skirt. Um, but anyway, it's the, it's not a skirt, it's whatever. But anyway, it's going to go around the area that the innovation district is going to be. You're going to see that go up in the next week or so. So fire up. Um, <laughs> And 
you know, it, the thing about economic development and, um, and in terms of both workforce and economy, uh, this EDS and MEDS anchor institution concept has been proven time and time again as being incredibly effective. And it drives, you know, creativity and innovation. It, it brings in the community. It brings in partnerships with businesses. I mean, they are super magnets for, for any community in which they, they actually have this kind of strategy deployed. And I can list a whole bunch of them, but this is going to be like taking all of that to the next level of sophistication, because not only are we going to have a new, you know, campus for the Wake Forest School of Medicine, Charlotte, because um, it's complementary and binding with the Wake Forest School of Medicine uh, in in Winston Salem. But we'll have the Innovation Quarter in Winston Salem now tied with the uh, the Pearl. If you look at their logos, they kind of look a little bit similar, even. And in that corridor in between. You know, Kannapolis is in between. I mean, like you've got all this growth potential that could really develop the western side of the state and share the research strength that we have up in Winston-Salem with the clinical strength we have here in Charlotte. I mean, it, it's it, the, the possibilities are on the list. But you asked about time frame. So you're going to start seeing the skirt go up, skirt, whatever it's called. I know I wrote it down somewhere. Um, but you're going to start seeing that go up soon. So destruction will begin. Um, the first students are going to be at coming in currently. We're already going to start teaching, you know, the second year students, second or yes, you know, third and fourth year students are already being trained. Our first year of full four-year students are going to be coming in next year. They're going to be in temporary mm -hmm. learning uh, environment, while the first actual in-building learning will happen in 2024. My goodness, it's happening so fast. But you know, you and I have spent a lot of time in meetings and being able to understand the difference between the medical school and the Pearl and the corridor. But for those that may not be as familiar, and maybe this sounds even like a foreign language to, to some extent, what is the difference between the Pearl and the medical school? So what is the Pearl actually going to be? So, and thank you for asking that. So the medical school and the research building associated with it, research building one, I'm sure it'll be named something more interesting than that at some point, um, mm -hmm. will be the anchor for this innovation district. And so the partnerships that will um, be generated from that is what's going to generate the pearl. So for example, IRCAD, um, which is, uh, it stands for a French term that I don't think it's relevant to what it is, but we all call it AirCAD, which is a robotic, an international robotic surgery training environment. Like the, think of the Da Vinci and other really high-end, highly technologically uh, adaptive um, uh, tools and devices that you can't like really show all over the place. I mean, you really can't invest in that sort of um, material and capital to, to, to train people on site. So if people are trained in these international, there's four locations in the world right now. We're gonna have the, um, the North American headquarters will be in research building one. Um, so that's the kind of gravitational pull that these anchor institutions can have. And then because of that gravitational pull, you're gonna see the device companies come in and partner and do their research associated with it. And there's already companies that have agreed to come in and, and open up offices, adjunct, adjunct offices for um, research and development and training of their own staff and their clients. And it's, you know, these things, there's more news that are gonna, that's gonna be coming. We're gonna roll it out to, you know, as we go along to keep people really excited. But this is, it's already happened. I mean, it's got that center of gravity. I mean, it's its truly transformative. And when you think about the, you know, the people that want to be the doctors and do this kind of surgery, they're going to gravitate to want to go to school here. And then people from all over the world that could benefit from this kind of surgery, you know, will coming here. So it's just amazing to think about the evolution of what this investment is going to bring to this, you know, to Charlotte and the region. You know, of course, the, Char you know, the Alliance we have a 15 county footprint between the two states and we operate as an economic unit. So you can imagine that while having this in Charlotte proper, it's going to have multiple benefits. And as you suggest, taking it to that next level where we're connecting it and creating this whole corridor, there's nothing like that in the world right now. Is that 
Is that a true that, statement? Yeah, it, that is very true. In fact, we're working with a development company, Wexford International. That's really the, they are going to be the ones that own and develop the Pearl. I mean, this isn't going to be a hospital-based innovation district. We're, we're the anchor, um, but for us, it, it probably wouldn't be happening. But this is not hospital money or hospital investment. This is like their investment that's going to be building this out. And they have, um, this is the only one in the, in the world that would have this mm -hmm. kind of really, uh, you know, dynamic. And they, they also developed Innovation Quarter. So that, that natural partnership is there. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a quarter, you know, it, like while I think of it in my mind as uh, Charlotte and Winston-Salem, this, this will go down to, Colum you know, Columbia. I mean, this will go down mm -hmm. to South Carolina mm -hmm. and it will have this opportunity to have a, you know, a broader impact. And I think that's what real, really excellence looks like. I agree, I agree. So, you know, I want to get back to the work that you do now in terms of being a lobbyist. And for those that are listening, help us understand kind of what, you know, what are you working on? Are you spending time working on the federal level, the state level, the local level, a mix of all? Well, I usually start with um, emphasizing the importance of policy development. I mean, people think of lobbyists as really with some varying degree of well-dressed person who gets to go to lunch and, you know, <laughs> pitch chat with people and go to receptions. And the reality is that the true advocacy and, and uh, lobbying activity starts with the development of solid policy. So mm -hmm. I know myself and my colleague, Mar Martha Ann McConnell, who, and, my, and Julie Windham, the, the few people on, the, on our government relations team, we spend easily, I, I feel like 80% of our time developing that internal knowledge mm -hmm identifying the issues, defining the issues, working with our trade associations and our advocates like you um, to roll it up and build coalitions around solid policy. And once we have that, um, you know, massaged, agreed to, pressure tested and coalition built, it actually gets easy to, 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 to lobby. You know, you've mm -hmm. got that, that content and that, um, that rigor behind whatever you're advocating for that, 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 gives it that life um, and that momentum. So um, that was a long way of saying, I work a lot on policy and I could go through, like I have a slide that goes through, these are the the, the working groups that were developing, um, you know, details around. Um, and then, so let's just argue for a minute, like the, the 15 policy groups that we're, we're working on developing new thought leadership, leaning edge policy. Cause when you're, when you're a sizable organization like a, us, you're expected to, to be pushing policy, not just reacting, not mm -hmm. just being no surprises. You know, a lot of us in government relations, we're in environments where it's like a no surprise strategy. Well, mm -hmm. but we have to push policy now. Um, and uh, I would say that the legislative cycles are nearing the end. There's big super bills that are gonna be going through the federal level at this point. The state is the same thing. Um, we're really making sure that we take advantage of every opportunity to attach um, you know, perfecting the legislation or relief funding or et cetera. But it's um, it, the center of gravity is coming together because we're at the end of the uh, nearing the election cycle. Um, but I'm still working hard on, on policy. And and you do work at all three levels, local, state and federal? Yes. Or do you specialize in one? Um, I tend to have more of my time spent federally just because of that's from where I came. Um, Martha Ann and my colleague, Julie Windham, focuses on state. And then um, when it comes to the local, all the other people on, people on my team are remote. So I'm the one who's here in um, the Charlotte region. So I tend to do my best to uh, stay connected with our county and city officials. Um, still have a lot of work to do to build those relationships, but that's what I rely on you for to help me get in. <laughs> well, and we're so privileged again to be able to work um, together and, and on such an important agenda for, for Charlotte and the region. So Kristen, you know, people, as you suggest, they think of lobbyists and, and as you said, you know, dress up, go to nice lunches and, and, and receptions, but sometimes it's, it's late nights and it's, you know, kind of nail biting at times. Do you have any experiences that you want to share in terms of, you know, a, a tough situation where someone listening could kind of take away a lesson or maybe something that you're like really proud of that was an unexpected win and you were able to, to make that happen? I, when you love, I, I can't believe I get paid to do what I do. I mean, being an advocate for good issues can be somewhat, um, 
you know, it, it, it can suck you into the point where you do forget that you do have your North star is your family or your North star is your wellness or, you know, whatever that might be at the, your point in life. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, I, I having people around you to remind you like, Hey, you know, maybe think about balancing that out a little bit. Cause your jobs don't do that for you in ever. I mean, if somebody asks in an interview, so tell me about work-life balance. I usually in a very gentle way, talk about like, you're in charge of your work-life balance. Your, your work will, is happy to take your entire life away from you. Um, it's up to you to do that in a responsible way. Um, and I think that was as a woman entering into a man's world in DC in the eighties was something that I had to learn the hard way. And I watched other women sacrifice their personal lives and everything else that would, i.e. be balance for the career, because that's what we were taught to do, that we had to outmen men for a long time. And especially in a world like DC, that was very important. Our generation has an, a moral obligation to teach the next generation what that, what that, that doesn't need to be the case that we had people who busted through that ceiling for us. Now we have a platform that we have the luxury to choose um, do we, you know, where we want to spend our priority time and what our North Stars are, but we can't do it all. Um, and I, I, and people didn't tell me that either. I always thought I could do it all. So that work-life balance was really uh, a journey. I hate that word, but I just said it anyway. Mm-hmm. And I'm still learning it um, all the time, but that's, that's one kind of life lesson that I teach somebody who loves what they do that you have to keep an eye toward not letting it take you over entirely. Well, I'm really happy to hear that you love what you do and I know you're very good at what you do and I'm really grateful for your time today and for your commitment to the advocacy committee with the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance. So I will end by just asking any sneak peeks uh, into what is next in terms of what you see in terms of 2023 with the legislative agenda? Well, um, I, I think that we're going to have, and in terms of a healthcare um, world, which is what my, I'm going to focus on right now, I do anticipate we're going to have some discussions at the state level around women's health um, due to the Supreme Court cases. Um, and it's going to be, and these are very emotional decisions. And um, since the first day I started lobbying healthcare and being an advocate, um, and even on the Hill, you really, it, legislating the practice of medicine is fraught with a lot of uh, challenges and danger. And this is gonna be a, a prime example of how difficult this is. Um, the practice of medicine is really most best handled between a patient and their clinician. Um, and, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna be, it's gonna be a very challenging um, time for, I think, people to, mm-hmm. to come to a really good place as a country, because it's not just in North Carolina. So that'll be taking up uh, a fair amount of time. Um, hospitals have had the single worst uh, quarter of their entire existence um, this, really? this last quarter. Um, the pandemic, the inflation rates, the supply chain challenges, our financial stability is, um, uh, is just, people are, I think, not talking about it entirely yet. We're just starting to, we're, it's hard to talk about because nobody wants mm-hmm. to, you know, mm-hmm. say that they're challenged financially. So we'll have to deal with a tremendous amount of how do we deal with um, the, the facts of what healthcare is costing these days and how do we maintain quality and access. So those are two that are right off the top of my head that I know are going to be tough. Um, I hope that we have some positive things we can work on too, but those are right out of the box going to be things we're preparing for. Well, that, that is certainly a sober note, but a, one that I'm going to say, I hope that you'll come back. I hope we can have another conversation as all of this unfolds and we can continue to understand the important work that you're doing and really understand the sector and understand how as, you know, just voters and lobbyists and big businesses and small businesses that are a part of the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance, how we can come together and make sure that the policies are in place for everybody to thrive. Just to actually, because I didn't say about it, this year, I wanted to thank you and your, for your leadership around Medicaid expansion. Mm-hmm. I don't think of that as a next year issue because I am very confident that we're going to figure out a way to come to an agreement in the state this year. But seriously, thank you and the Charlotte Business Alliance for for coming together with that. So I just didn't want to let you go without saying that. 
You know, I really appreciate you saying that. And I'm so proud of our team and, you know, the work that we did reaching out and, you know, organizing the other chambers in the state. And I mean, the numbers just make sense. And the people that will be helped because of it, it's, it just has to happen. So yes, I'm with you. We're shooting for this happening this year and we'll definitely be celebrating that. So thank you for those kind words and thank you for being here today and thank you for your work on the advocacy committee. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in. Um, please watch the advocate newsletter for programming information and we look forward to our next conversation. Have a great day, thank you. Thanks for tuning in. You can learn more about the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance and its advocacy agenda at charlotteregion.com.